Oh, it's a joy to be here with you. I, I could just talk the whole evening to friends and uh, previous acquaintances, and um, I'm just, uh, it's, a, it's an honor, a privilege to be here. I think the world of the work of uh, Viola and Talbot and uh, living not too far away in Scottsdale, Arizona, and a lot of times parents come and say, where should we send our children to college? And Viola is right up at the top. I think it is my top recommendation. Um, so uh, I'm thankful for that and thankful for the work of the Biola faculty. I just, I can't mention everybody I know here, but Bob Sosi and I have known each other for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, it's good to see your smiling face out there, Bob. Well, my um, academic dean used to be your academic dean. That's Bing Hunter. And he sends greetings. And he just has such fond uh, memories in, uh, in his heart of his time here at Talbot. And then um, my president, Daryl Delhuse, is a Talbot graduate. Uh, he was a pastor of Scottsdale Bible Church for 25 years, senior pastor, and now he's full-time president of, of Phoenix Seminary. We are not as large as Talbot. We, have, we had 197 students last year. We have 214 this year. Um, but then I think to myself, when I went to Westminster Seminary, we had 187 students. So. Um, it's a, good, it's a good situation. God has brought a lot of blessing to us uh, there in Phoenix, and so we're thankful for that. There are two handouts that you got coming in the door, I think. If you don't have one, hold your hand up high in the air, and maybe someone will bring it to you. I guess everyone has one. Good. I, uh, I just want to say one more thing. I'm going to be talking about a theology of work tonight. Uh, some of the material uh, comes out of or is adapted from this little book that I wrote called Business for the Glory of God. And it's an honor for me to meet Bill Pollard tonight for the first time. Bill is here. And to my chagrin, the last printing of this book misspelled his name on the back cover when he gave an endorsement. <laughs> now, you have to say the publisher did get six of the seven letters right. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, instead of Pollard, it's just Poller. I don't know why. But I've, I've sent them an, an alarmed note, and they'll get it right, they tell me next time. I'm sorry, Bill. Other material that I'm talking about is uh, coming from, somewhat coming from this book that I published a year ago called Politics According to the Bible. And um, there's a section in there on economics, and uh, so I just wanted to mention those things. All right. So... A theology of work, and I'm going to follow the outline you have on the white handout. Oh, the blue handout is not required reading. It's supplemental, in case you want to do more than is required for the course. Um, but it's just uh, some comments that I've made on uh, various books on economic development in particular. Uh, so on the white outline, point A, the moral goodness of productive work. Point one, God commands us to work. Even before there was sin in the world, God put man in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Genesis 2.15, thus demonstrating the moral goodness of productive work and its necessity for fulfilling God's purpose for us here on the earth. Paul told the Thessalonian church, with toil and labor we worked night and day. And this was to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. So they were to do what Paul did and to work. Then Paul added, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat, unless he's at a faculty retreat. <laughs> Therefore, the Bible views work, productive work as morally good, and even commands that Christians should work heartily for the Lord and not for man, Colossians 3.23. 3, Colossians in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes speaks of joy in one's work. Ecclesiastes 2.24 and 25, there is nothing better for a person then that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? Now, um, after I prepared this talk, I thought I'd better check and see what Scott Ray said about work in his ethics book. Where are you, Scott? You're here, some, and he's moderating. So, and I loved it. Um, uh, in Moral Choices, page 334, work will also be a part of the world after the Lord's return. And he looks at the prophetic section, Isaiah 2-4, about beating swords into plowshares, 
or, uh, spear, uh, yeah, and spears into pruning hooks and says, if you have a plowshare and a pruning hook, hmm, looks like you're going to be working <laughs> in the age to come. Very interesting. And I liked it. I, Scott, there was a new thought for me. So thank you. It was good. When this positive viewpoint on work, that it's morally good and we're to take delight in it, enjoy it, when this positive viewpoint, that it's God's purpose for us, that, that he wants us to be productive workers, when this is affirmed by a society, why then working at a regular job is seen as a rightful source of personal fulfillment and dignity. And the culture in general assumes that honorable people at least will strive to become diligent, faithful, cheerful workers who willingly do a bit more than what is required because they view productive work as morally good and they really believe that God will be pleased if they strive for excellence in their work. Number two, work should be balanced with times of rest. God also built times of periodic rest into the structure of his people's lives. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. I realize that Christians today differ over the exact way in which this command applies to believers who live under the new covenant in Christ. But I think all Christians today would agree that at least it is still wise for us to take regular times of rest from work. In doing this, we rightly imitate God himself, who saw that everything he had made was very good and then rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done, surely on that day enjoying and taking delight in the work of his hands. Number three, Workers should be able to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Just as God delighted in the results of his creative work, so he commends to us enjoying the fruits of our labor. As I mentioned, again, Ecclesiastes talks about this. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. And 1 Timothy 6, 17 says God is the one who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Point B, sin distorts work into laziness or workaholism. If this biblical view of work is lost in a society, then a secular worldview will tend toward various harmful consequences. And I want to mention two. Laziness is the first one. There will be a failure to view productive work in a positive way, and that will lead many in society to lead lives of laziness and poor work habits. People will place more of their hope for becoming wealthy, not on hard work of good quality, but rather on getting something for nothing, such as in the lottery. There will be more of a tendency to think that those who do well economically are just lucky, and those who do not do well are just the victims of bad luck. With an increase in laziness, there will be more of a tendency to view economically productive people with envy, thinking they do not deserve what they've earned, but they should rather feel guilt and shame. And there will be a tendency to argue that economic reward in the workplace should not be based on merit or the quality of one work, one's work, but should be allocated only according to seniority or some other non-merit-based system. In addition, among those who exchange the goodness of work for laziness, the goal of life will not be seen as having an economically productive life that finds fulfillment in doing work that brings value to others, but the goal will rather be in increasing leisure pursuits, longer weekends and vacations, and then complete retirement that results in little, if any, productivity, even though one may have 20 or 30 more years of health and strength. Witness retirement at age 55 in France and Greece. If I have that age rightly, I. I didn't have an opportunity to look it up and confirm it. People become consumers and not producers. More and more people become takers and not makers. And then a sense of entitlement begins to pervade their thinking. Witness the riots in Greece among people who are outraged that their benefits might be cut. This comes from the loss of a biblical worldview of the goodness of work. On the other hand, 
you have workaholics. The desire for material prosperity can become a different kind of idol, with people working incessantly, driving themselves day and night to accumulate more and more, but never having enough. Modern Japan is an economic miracle, a small nation that today has the second largest economy in the world, unless you believe the statistics that China is putting out about its own economic productivity, and then Japan has the third largest economy in the world, but I mean, and nevertheless, it's either second or third, only to the United States and China. But Japan lacked a Christian worldview, and its immense economic growth came about because it basically adopted a form of Buddhism that made work into a religion. Suicide and divorce rates are high, and wealth has not led to true fulfillment or happiness. However, Japan is not alone in this, for many business people in the United States have followed the same pattern of life, and after 30 years, the result is large homes and fancy cars, but destroyed marriages, alienated children, and broken health. The preacher in Ecclesiastes also understood this evil. He said, there is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 and 2. So that's point A and B. But now, I wonder if we can probe a little bit deeper and ask, why? Why did God create us so that we would have to work? And why do we have a deep desire to perform useful work? Sometimes when I ask those why questions about why God did this or that, it, it's helpful to me to think, what's the difference between human beings and the rest of creation? Um, rocks and hills don't work. And plants don't carry out any conscious work, they just keep growing. But human beings have to work. Why? Um, well, I, I want to suggest uh, several reasons, but they fall under this general category, point C. God gave us work so that we could glorify Him in multiple ways. I don't think I've thought of all of them, but I've listed six here. Number one, work gives us the privilege of creating something new in imitation of God's creativity. When we work to create new things, we imitate God's creative activity and also God's wisdom, skill, strength, intelligence, and many other attributes. Now, I think we've lost the wonder of this, and we take things for granted so easily. So I want you to imagine with me for a minute that we could get a time capsule and transport Adam and Eve into the room tonight and clothe them appropriately. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> business casual, yeah, okay. Uh, and they'd begin to look around the room, and, and, uh, and Adam might say, well, what's this? <laughs> I'd say, well, that's water. Are you thirsty? Sure. Wow. You don't have to go to a stream and bend down to get water? You just, you just have it in this little container? Yes. Well, where did you get this thing? Well, Adam, uh, God put materials in the earth that would let us invent that from black, oozy, gooky stuff called oil. Really? But you can see through it. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? And, but, but wait a minute. How did you know how to make this from oil? Well, um, God gave us wisdom and skill, and curiosity. And he let us investigate and gain more and more knowledge of what his creation was like, and all of a sudden we have a bottle of water. Oh, Adam would say, praise be to God. He put those resources in the earth. He gave you the wisdom to understand and make them. What an amazing God. And then he'd say, well, I thought it was nighttime. What, 
what, is, what are these? Well, those are electric lights. Where do you get them? Are they stars? No, they're not stars. Um, we made those out of the earth. Really? Praise God. That he gave us, he gave, he gave you the wisdom to, to understand how to make that. Yes, actually it was a man named Thomas Edison. I could tell you more about him, Adam, but we'll get to that later. And, and you can just turn these on at any time, day or night, and you can have light to see each other and to meet together and to worship God together. Yes. What a wonderful God to put resources in the earth that enable us to have light. And so on and on and on. We get a cell phone. You want to talk to Eve? She's in the other city, going out shopping someplace. Uh, and he, he would be just, again and again, overflowing in his heart with praise to God for God's goodness and kindness and uh, wisdom in giving us these things and showing us, uh, in enabling us to discover how to use them and make them. So it's an amazing process of creating something new and in doing that, whether it's creating paper from a tree or plastic from petroleum or a laptop computer in which the silicon chip is made from sand, in all of that, we are imitating God's own creative activity. Now, we'll never be the same as God. He creates out of nothing, the whole universe. We create out of previously existing matter, different new products. But it imitates in a little bit God's ability to create. And so we are fulfilling Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God as beloved children. He just as just as God is love and he delights to see us acting in love toward each other, just as God is truth and he loves us to see us telling the truth to each other, just as God is faithful and he loves to see us be faithful to our marriage promises and our other commitments, just as God is merciful and be, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful, we love because he first loved us. In multiple ways, we imitate God and thereby show to angels and to the world who have eyes, who have eyes to see the excellence of our Creator. So we're, we're like God, we, Im, we uh, imitate Him on the earth, we represent Him on the earth, and that comes about because when we create products from the earth, we imitate God's creativity. And God made us so we enjoy doing that. It's fun. Whether it's baking a cake, or grilling steak, or um, inventing some, or, new product from the earth, we have a delight in that. Now, animals can do some work. Horses and oxen can plow, and dogs can herd sheep or act as watchdogs, but only human beings can create, invent, innovate. No animal has ever used intelligent thought to create a new product that others would buy. No watchdog has ever figured out how to build a, an electric fence to keep the sheep in at night and then sold it to other dogs. Great idea, but it never worked. <laughs> Our ability to work shows an important aspect of the excellence of human nature as created by God. And when we see it happening, we should give thanks to God for it, just as Adam would have. Number two, work gives us the privilege of creating value, also in imitation of God's creativity. Even if we don't invent an entirely new product, when we work to produce the same thing again and again and again, in manufacturing, for instance, we're still doing the amazing task of adding to the total value of things that exist in the world. I'll take a simple example. A woman in a poor country, she has a piece of cloth that cost her $3. She sews it into a shirt, takes it to the marketplace, and sells it for $13. That is an amazing process because she has added $10 of value to the world that didn't exist before. Where'd the $10 come from? She created that, does, does that make sense? I, I, I'm making the front, at least I'm, one person is understanding me. It's, it's, it, it, that $13 shirt did not exist before. 
There was cloth that was worth $3, but it became $13. New value was created, and the entire process of human productivity throughout all history, so that we've gone from uh, subsistence level hunting and gathering to having a retreat at La Quinta Resort, that whole process has come, come because people has create, have created value that did not exist before. Or take another example. I got these yesterday at Lens Crafters. Now I expect that the piece of plastic in here The raw materials might be worth three cents, if that. And the metal, maybe five cents. Eight cents worth of materials. I'm ashamed to tell you how much lens crafters <laughs> charge me for this. We they, well, you know, you've been there. Um, the former CEO of lens crafters put an endorsement on the back of my book, so I can't really complain too much. I think they're a great company. This is my, they looked it up, this is my ninth pair of lens crafters frames. So. Um, but all of a sudden, I mean, these, these two highly special prescriptions and shatterproof lenses and everything, the lenses themselves cost around $100. All of a sudden, the lens crafter's technician made three cents of plastic into $100 of value. And now this value exists in the world that did not exist in the world yesterday. Is that making sense? It's an amazing process of adding value to the total value of what exists in the world. Now my examples are material goods, shirt, glasses, but I have Bill Pollard here who has a service industry, not particularly making goods, but freeing your home from termites. There is a value to having a home free from termites, I think. <laughs> or Service Master owns Merry Maids, which is a house cleaning and House, clean houses are valuable. That's adding a value. And um, True Green is a service industry, but it makes beautiful lawns. That's valuable. That's adding beauty, which has a dimension of value in this world. So uh, a doctor who cures or diagnoses and gives you medicine for pneumonia, that's not a pro material product that's created. It's a service. A teacher who teaches students how to read, has that added value to the society? Oh, of course. It's added value by teaching students how to read. So I'm going to use material products as examples primarily, but I want you to remember that services are also material goods that add value to the world. When God gives us work to do, it's an amazing thing. See, God didn't make us just to dig ditches one day and fill them in the next, and then dig them again over and over and over again. God made us so that our work adds value to the world, and God is pleased in that because it reflects in a faint way the excellence of our infinitely wise God who alone created the whole universe with all the value that it has and created it out of nothing. And then it uh, was interesting to me, and I was delighted to see it, that um, a year ago, book number 11 on your outline, on your blue sheet, came out. Arthur Brooks' The Battle. Marvin Olasky and World Magazine named it their book of the year. Arthur Brooks uh, did a lot of research in business and sociology together, trying to find out in the economic realm what makes people happy. And he argues in this book that what makes people happy is not money. In fact, lottery winners and other sudden inheritors of windfall wealth often have really destructive consequences in their lives. Money didn't give them happiness. What is it? He said there is a secret to what makes people happy, and he called it earned success. That is, having a responsibility and doing it well. I have a student at Phoenix Seminary who's a great example of this. He's an excellent student now. But as I got to know him a little more, I found out he had a checkered background. Been into dealing, using drugs, dealing drugs, had spent some time in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's famous tent city prison, a miserable place. 
he tells me, was on the wrong side of the law. But after he got out, somehow he got a job at Wendy's. And one day his manager said to him, you're doing a good job keeping the french fries hot. He said that comment was a turning point in his life. He had earned success, is what Arthur Brooks would say. He had been given a responsibility, and he found out he was doing it well. He was keeping the french fries hot. And he said, as he began to think about that, he began to think, you know, if I keep on doing this, maybe they'll make me a shift manager. Or maybe I could even be a manager of all of Wendy's. Right now, he's a straight-A student at Phoenix Seminary, and he's applying for law school next year. And he's going to have a remarkable, productive career. Earned success is what makes people happy. Now, Arthur Brooks doesn't quote the Bible when he talks about this. But when I saw that, I thought, this fits. God made us so that we gain satisfaction from having responsibility and doing it well performing a job so that we glorify him by doing meaningful activities, creating new products or creating value in the products we made. Number three, work gives us the privilege of supporting ourselves in imitation of God's independence. Uh, when children grow up and are able to support themselves, it gives them a new sense of dignity and self-respect. And this, I think, is a way that God intends us to glorify him by imitating his attribute of independence though in a faint way. And so God expects people to care for their own financial situations, to work with their hands and be dependent on no one, 1 Thessalonians 4.12. Welfare does not do this, and therefore the goal of welfare, of course, should always be to move people off of welfare into economically productive jobs. Number four, work gives us the privilege of enjoying the fruits of our labor in imitation of God's joy, or what theologians call God's blessedness. I hinted at this already. At the end of the sixth day, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Who is thinking it's very good? Well, it's God thinking that it's very good. He's taking delight in what he has made. He enjoyed the fruits of his labor. And I suppose that he went on contemplating and enjoying that for the seventh day as well. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done, Genesis 2.2. So I think in imitation of God's delight in what he has done, he wants us to and gives us permission to and encourages us to take delight in the fruits of our labor, to enjoy what we've made. For God is the one who richly provides us with everything to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6.17 in enjoying what we have made with thanksgiving to God, not with pride in our own accomplishments, but with thanksgiving to God, in delighting in what we have made or the fruits of our labor, we glorify God. Number five, work gives us the privilege of doing good for one another in the marketplace in imitation of God's love. So God made us all to be different different skills, different preferences, and it leads us to specialize in all sorts of different activities. There's a division of labor, and that makes the human race thousands of times more productive than if we, already, if we all individually had to produce everything for ourselves, as in the animal kingdom. Uh, horses don't have teams where one of them brings the water and one of them brings the hay. They all have to go get their own hay and their own water. And so cows and giraffes and, animal, and uh, elephants and everything else. But God made us to be able to have different interests and to specialize. And so human productivity is multiplied. And there's a famous passage in Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, where he talks about one man making pins, which were, wow, well, one man making pins might make 10 a day. But when they divide up the tasks, uh, the productivity is more than is several thousand per, per person per day. So when one person makes hundreds of shirts and another grows thousands of tomatoes and other people produce cars and computers, a huge network of human interdependency and human interrelationships is created. And in order to succeed in that 
interconnected network, people have to produce things that other people really want. In other words, they have to serve others in order to succeed in the marketplace. Otherwise, their goods won't sell. In this way, business transactions are a way of loving your neighbor as yourself. That's because a voluntary business transaction ordinarily brings benefit to both buyer and seller. So we have a bakery not too far from our house called Wildflower Bread Company. When I voluntarily buy a loaf of bread from Wildflower for $4, I'm using my money to say that the bread is more valuable to me than the $4. And so I'll make the purchase. I genuinely believe that I am better off driving home with that loaf of bread because I wanted the bread more than I wanted the $4. The baker has done good for me. The baker has improved my situation of life. Amazing. But the baker wanted my money more than he wanted the loaf of bread. After all, if he didn't sell it, it was going to get stale within the remainder of the day. He's happy to put the $4 in his cash register, so he believes that I have done good for him. In this way, a voluntary business transaction does good for both parties. It is win-win. Therefore, a Christian worldview understands buying and selling in the free market. To be a way of fulfilling Jesus' command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And for those of you who are business people here today, I just want to encourage you, every, product, every time you make a sale, every time you make a transaction, I want to encourage you to think, I'm loving my neighbor as myself. I'm doing good for my neighbor because I'm bringing benefit to my neighbor. And how do I know I'm bringing benefit? Because he gave me money for it and showed that he valued it. Interestingly enough, it's not just that you create value in the world by turning plastic into lenses. You also create value in the world by offering a product for more than it costs you to produce and then selling it for that. Because, see, before I bought that loaf of bread, the materials in that bread were just worth $2. The baker made it, but he wasn't sure how much it was worth until I came along and bought it. And I bought it for four dollars. Whoop! Two more dollars of value added to the world by the fact that there's a valuable product that I purchased, and I show that I value it more than what it cost him to produce. So, Buying and selling in voluntary transactions are, is a win-win situation. It's a way of doing good for one another, of, of caring for one another, of helping one another. I say, I'm, what I'm trying to do in all of this is to say, everything that you do in business, it, it, no. I'm trying to say, the value of a Christian going into business is not just witnessing to your employees and not just giving money to missions. So those are the two things that mostly people talk about for the value of business but it's the business activity in itself that is glorifying God and bringing value to the world and loving our neighbors as ourselves. In a similar way, employer-employee relationships are doing good for one another. I truly believe that Phoenix Seminary is doing good for me when it pays my salary, which actually I think it might have done today. So <laughs> And I happily work to receive that salary. But Phoenix Seminary apparently thinks that I'm doing good for the seminary when I teach there. And so they continue to employ me year after year. I'm doing good for them, and they're doing good for me. Every time I complete a month of teaching and am paid for it, the seminary is better off, and I'm better off. We're both better off. It's win-win. And therefore, the situation of one person working for another is in the business world another way of fulfilling Jesus' command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's doing good for others. So with that background, now I just want to say a word about profits. 
I was an economics major at Harvard, and profits was close to a swear word. <laughs> Ooh, student, you know, students would kind of react when, when you know, profit. But in a, in a free market, I think that profits can be understood as a measure of how much good a business has done for other people. And therefore, those who make the biggest profits have best acted in love for others. If not in their motives, at least in their results. And perhaps in motives too. Let me explain. Uh, a couple of years ago, Bill Gates was worth about $58 billion. Now, what do I think about that? He shouldn't have all that? Well, it shows me that the consumers of the world, including me, because I've bought Microsoft computer programs and Microsoft keyboard and Microsoft other, who knows what Microsoft stuff I have, lots. Microsoft Word, Excel, I don't know, okay. The whole world has decided to pay Bill Gates enough for those products that he's made $58 billion of profits. So the baker gained $2 profit on a loaf of bread. The baker did $2 worth of good economic good for the world. Well, doesn't it follow then if Bill Gates has $58 billion worth of profit, he's added $58 billion worth of value to the world? Hmm. You may say, no, I don't think it's worth all that. It's not, he's, not, he's not really added $58 billion worth of value to the world. And my answer is, all the people in the world voted with their dollars, and they decided it was worth $58 billion. So you may think that it wasn't worth it, but the whole world decides otherwise. And so you're standing against the whole world. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> the godly woman of Proverbs 31 is one who perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Proverbs 31, 18. And when I checked the Hebrew word there, it looked to me like it was it was appropriate to think it means the kind of thing that we talk about when we say profits today. So this godly woman earns a profit from selling what she has produced. The good and faithful servant in Jesus' parable of the talents in Matthew 25, 20 is one whose five talents, pause just a minute, talent was worth about $400,000 in today's terms, multiplying what was a daily wage of a laborer to daily wage of a laborer today. Five talents worth about $2 million dollars in 2011 terms. The, the good and faithful servant in Jesus' parable is the one who's two million dollars, five talents, through wise investment and development made five talents more, two million more dollars, he made a two million dollar profit. Good and wise servant. Why is profit in, generally morally, in general morally good? Because, as I said, profit is a measure of how much value you have added to society. Number six, work glorifies God because work gives us the privilege of relating to one another, depending on one another, and serving one another in imitation of God's Trinitarian existence. In the modern economy, people cannot just become hermits. They need to interact with each other in giant human networks of buying and selling that collectively we call the market. And I think God made us so we had to do that because he wanted us to interact. He didn't want us to be isolated individuals. He wanted us to relate to each other, and ultimately that relationship that we carry out with one another is a reflection of God's Trinitarian nature and the fact that there have been interpersonal relationships among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Trinity for all eternity. In other words, God is a relational God, and he made us so that we have to work, and we have to have a drive to work, and we have to have a drive to produce things that other people will value because he wanted us to be relational people, to serve one another and depend on one another. So that's six reasons why, we, why work allows us to glorify God. And then I looked at Scott Ray's book and I found a seventh. 
in Moral Choices, he says, we work in imitation of God who is a worker. I hadn't thought of that. Genesis 1 to 2. In Exodus 20, 11, Scott points out in the Ten Commandments, even says this. Six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and rest of the seventh day, so you are to work. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. And the seventh is the Sabbath for the Lord, to the Lord your God, because this is what God did. So we imitate God's work as a worker. And then when we were doing the worship time here, I thought of an eighth reason. Um, when we discover products from the earth, we imitate God's knowledge by thinking his thoughts after him. He knew for... Since the day they created the world, that petroleum could make see-through plastic bottles that don't leak. But it took us until the 20th century to discover that you can use plastic to make thousands of things. Amazing. And it was just sitting there, oozing for centuries. Useless. And then people discover use for it. And the same way with sand to be able to make computer chips. It's amazing. But God knew it all along. Now we're imitating his knowledge by discovering what he knew about sand from the, create, from the creation. Well, point D. God wants us not just to survive, but to flourish on the earth. And I'm, I'm going to say that this idea of human flourishing on the earth, in an economic sense, people in the business world are primarily the ones who make this happen. And pastors are primarily the ones who should teach and encourage them to make this happen. So think about this. God wants us to do more than survive. Plants and animals show a measure of God's glory by merely surviving and repeating the same activities for thousands of years. Birds build the same nests, and chickens build the same eggs, and rabbits eat the same grass and clover, and, and biologists look at that, and Christian biologists say, this is amazing. Look at how God made these, thing, these animals to function, and they find the right food, and digest it, and they live, and they survive, and they bear children, and they die. That's something. But we glorify God much more substantially by understanding and ruling over the creation and then producing more and more wonderful goods from it for our enjoyment and with thanksgiving to God. And so everything, and so we should not reject things because everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it's made holy by the word of God in prayer. I think that applies not only to food, and that was the issue in 1 Timothy 4, but I think... Um, Computers and cars and airplanes, too. We should be thankful for those because God is the one who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. This also follows from the fact that God entrusted us with stewardship of the earth and told us to subdue the earth. When God entrusts us with stewardship, he implies an expectation of human achievement. He wants us to do something worthwhile with what he has entrusted to us. Not just guard it, so it just kind of grows weeds all over every year, but produce from it. So what do I mean by human achievement and human flourishing? The range of human activity is vast. It includes, yes, the, the physical sciences and technology and industry and commerce, but it also includes the arts and beauty. And it also includes all of the social sciences and the relationships we have in family, community, nation, and church. And we build churches, we build communities, we build relationships, and we, we, human achievement and flourishing it actually is affected by every honorable occupation that there is. And then the human drive to understand and create from the world is unlimited, and so the history of science is filled with Christians who have explored God's rational and orderly world in order to find out secrets of how it works. And we have that drive to understand the world and find out more about it. Rabbits and squirrels, birds and deer are content to live in the same kinds of homes and eat the same kinds of food for thousands of generations, but human beings have an innate desire to explore, to discover, to invent, to understand, to create, to produce, and then to enjoy the products that can be made from the earth. This innate human drive to subdue the earth has never been satisfied throughout the history of mankind because we keep discovering more things. And this innate human drive to subdue the earth through discovery and exploration and invention, I do not think it will ever be satisfied for all eternity. God created us, created us not merely to survive on the earth, earth, but to flourish. Number two, God created us with limited needs but unlimited wants. And therefore, human work 
can always be interesting and challenging. Our limited needs are basically food, clothing, and shelter. Once these needs are met, people will survive, even if they don't have a very pleasant life. Robinson Crusoe on a deserted island will live if he has adequate food, clothing, and shelter. And people in miserable prisons in foreign countries can survive on food, clothing, and shelter. All people have those basic needs. But people have unlimited wants. How do I know? Because I lived for over 40 years without knowing that I wanted a cell phone. <laughs> but once cell phones became popular, I decided to buy one. People lived for many centuries without knowing that they wanted electricity in their homes. In the early part of the 20th century, it became available. They didn't know that they wanted running water and electric refrigerators and gas stoves because these things didn't exist. They didn't know until the 1950s. People didn't know in the warmer climates in the United States, they didn't know that they wanted electric air conditioners in their homes because affordable, portable home units had not yet been invented. People lived for centuries without knowing that they wanted cars to drive and paved roads and street lights and stop signs and even McDonald's hamburgers, and Starbucks coffee, and frozen yogurt. Once these things become available, if we're able to buy them, we decide to do so because we think that they somehow improve our quality of life. And I don't think that decision is a sinful one. I agree that they do improve our quality of life, and 99.99% of the people who live in societies where these things are available agree with me because they purchase them for themselves when they're able to do so. Now, I realize that there are temptations and complications of life that come with acquiring more possessions. And we can wrongly make possessions an idol, and we can wrongly desire to be rich and fall into temptations, into a snare, into many harmful and hurtful desires. But those temptations and those complications of life do not detract from the point that almost everyone on earth thinks that, in general, new inventions that we desire are basically good and good for us. They improve our lives. We don't need these things to survive, but I think we need them to fulfill God's purposes for us on the earth. And I think producing them and enjoying them are necessary for God's purposes for us, for fulfilling God's purposes for us on the earth. Now, um, I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to just mention but skip over section 3. Throughout the rest of the Bible, one of God's blessings is increased productivity from the earth, and one of God's curses is hindered laborious productivity and ultimately even famine in a desolate, unproductive earth. And you think of the blessings and the curses on Israel, for instance. Um, and you think of the new heavens and new earth into which the kings of the earth bring the glory and honor of the nations into the heavenly city. There's material productivity and the, um, the uh, tree of life bears uh, 12 manner of, fruit, uh, manner of fruit each month and the fruit is for the healing of the nations. And, uh, there's, a, there's continuing material productivity. But I, 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 and, of course, the hindrance on it came with a curse uh, to Adam and Eve when uh, thorns and thistles God made the earth bring forth for them. But then the rest of the Bible shows that he, when he blesses his people, he removes that curse. I'm going to skip over that survey of the Bible and go to point E, and with this we'll be done. What will lead to greater human flourishing in work? Um, I'm going to mention three primary factors out of about 50. Um, and I'll just, a little parenthesis here. My current writing project is tentatively called A Permanent Solution to Poverty in Poor Nations. And I'm co-authoring it with Barry Asmus, an economics professor who has been an elder with me at Scottsdale Bible Church, and so we're right now this fall in the middle of that, and we've got about 50 factors that lead to uh, increasing productivity and overcoming poverty in poor nations. But I'm gonna mention three of the key ones uh, here and, uh, and just close with that section. What will lead to the greater human flourishing or what promotes it or what hinders people from flourishing at work? This leads me to say something briefly about governments and economic systems. I hope it's not outside the parameters of our discussion of the theology of work tonight, 
but it is showing what is helpful in making worth, work useful and productive to fulfilling its goals. Number one, private ownership of property. I would mention to you the first two books on this blue sheet. David Landis, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, Why Some Are So Rich and Some So Poor. This is really the culmination of Landis's life work. Landis is an emeritus professor of the history of economics at Harvard. And um, he traces whole regions of the world one at a time for the last 500 years and say, shows why some developed and became productive and wealthy and some did not. And one invariable factor is if a country does not allow private ownership of property, it remains trapped in poverty forever. Communism takes away private ownership of property. It impoverishes nations. Feudal systems in the Middle Ages, where the lord was over all and the serfs couldn't gain ownership of property, they remained trapped in poverty. Um, and uh, Latin American countries, there are some where there is, in a technical sense, private ownership, but it's like a very small handful of wealthy, wealthy families who own all the land and nobody else has a chance even to own property at all. Uh, and then government systems are built up to prevent people from gaining li license ownership of property. And so it basically is impossible. And, uh, and Landis shows that in country after country throughout the history of the world. Then the second book on the outline there is Hernando de Soto, The Mystery of Capital, Why Capitalism Triumphs in the West and Fails Everywhere Else. De Soto is a Peruvian economist. His offices are in Lima, Peru. And De Soto traces the history of economic development in North America, for instance, and shows how property rights as the American West developed led to increasing prosperity for the whole society because people could acquire property. And now he says half the businesses that are started in the United States, new businesses are started because people own a house and they can take a second mortgage on it. And they can get some financing to start a business. And if you own, a business, if you own property, you have an address. Therefore, you can get credit, you can get electricity, you can get a telephone. But he said millions of people in many countries of the world are unable to own property and they're trapped in poverty forever. And um, I was flying uh, into the Phoenix airport um, a while ago and I looked out the window and I thought, what a great picture to demonstrate exactly this tragedy. And it was the boundary line, it's just like, the picture is taken like, five miles from where I live, and it's an area I drive by every day to go to the seminary or to go to the airport. You go look at one side of the road, it's Scottsdale, Arizona, where a realtor in, in uh, real estate development told me it's about, now with the decline in real estate prices, the land is worth about half a million dollars an acre. Fabulously wealthy area, residential and commercial. And then you go to the other side of the 101, it's Indian land, and it's barren. Because Indian land has predominantly a system of tribal ownership of property. So you may want to sell a piece of land, but your uncle has a claim on it, and your three cousins have a claim on it, and your grandfather, or every other relative. And so trying to buy or sell land is basically impossible because the tribe owns the land. Many countries in Africa have remnants of that tribal ownership of property as well, and it traps them in poverty. Now, now Carson, can I show that picture? Here it is. Here's the aerial view of Scottsdale. Here is residential property. This is a neighborhood I cannot afford to live in. Um, and it's, it's, I said, half a million dollars per acre. And here's commercial property that's very productive. This is Indian land, barren. The economic productivity of that land is zero dollars per year. Now, a little bit south of this, there's some cotton growing. It's not getting the value of half a million dollars a year uh, that, would, that would be the return on property. So that's kind of a visual picture of the difference between private ownership of land and 
and, uh, and preventing private ownership of land through tribal ownership or some other means. The Bible assumes a system in which property generally belongs to individuals and not to government. Why? Exodus 20, 15. You shall not steal. I should not steal Carson's MacBook laptop back here. Because it belongs to Carson. It doesn't belong to me. When the Bible commands you shall not steal, it means I shouldn't take your ox or your donkey. Or in modern society, I shouldn't take your car. And see, if I ever happen to be a guest at Bill Gates' house and walked into a room and there were two or three dollar bills lying there on the counter. I would have no moral right to take those dollar bills. I don't have a right to say, oh, he won't miss it. The Bible commands you, you shall not steal. So I can't take those dollar bills because they belong to Bill Gates and they don't belong to me. And God says you shall not steal. So in the command not to steal is, assumption, is an assumption of private property. And you shall not covet expands the heart desires that correlate to you shall not steal. And you shall not cover your neighbor's house. In the year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25.10, every one of you is to return to his property. It was a restoration of private ownership of land for the family that owned it. And Exodus 22, 1-15 and many other of the provisions in the Mosaic Law Code give protections of private property. So if you light a fire and your neighbor's green burns, here's how much you have to pay him. Or if you steal an ox, and then you have to give back five oxen. There's all sorts of property protections built into the Mosaic Law. This puts the Bible in direct contradiction to communism. Because Karl Marx says in the Communist Manifesto, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. And because of that, I think communism is the most dehumanizing economic system ever devised by man. So private ownership of property, um, I think that means that the default owner of property in a society should not be the government. And I think it means that we should not assume that government has the right to take property from one person and allocate it to another because it thinks it is the, right, is the just allocator of property. Government has the right to tax in order to punish evil and reward good, and maintain order, that's Romans 13. But I do not think that the Bible gives government a legitimate right simply to redistribute income from one to another because it thinks that it should own the property or should decide who owns the property. When government strives for income equality, it inevitably hinders helping the poor because it hinders economic growth, which is the only effective means to truly help the poor. Um, I'm going to skip over the rest of that because we're running out of time. Then number two, point number two, the free market as the primary director of economic decisions. Um, I've got some reasons why I think the Bible supports the idea of a free market. Number one, private property. Number two, government shouldn't own property. Number three, the Bible gives repeated warnings against a ruler who continually takes and takes and takes more of the property for himself. Samuel said in 1 Samuel 8, these will be the ways of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and fifties and he will take your daughters to be for humors. He will take your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and, vineyard and uh, his grain, and you will be his slaves. So there's a warning. Um, so I've got a definition of free market here. I think, Mick, I'm, I think I want to stop because we're, we're um, or Dennis, where are you? Um, I think probably you want to have time for a panel discussion. Um, Okay, um, let's see. What's a free market? It means that the free market uh, decides economic decision, makes, directs economic activity, not government. 
To get an idea of this, imagine that you are hovering in a helicopter above a local convenience store. Do you have 7-Elevens here in? OK. You're hovering in a helicopter for 24 hours above a local 7-Eleven. And you watch. And you see that a van comes in and brings milk and eggs. Another one comes in and brings newspapers. Another comes in and brings aspirin. Another comes in and brings oranges and apples. And another comes in and uh, brings quarts of oil. And, 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 then, and then you wait for a year. And every day that year, you go in and you say, I'm going to try some other item. I'll try milk this time, and I'm going to try eggs, and I'm going to try bananas, and then I'm going to try a, a wooden ruler and a pen, and then I'm going to try to get a newspaper. And guess what? It's always there. And that's really important because if the manager orders too much milk or too many eggs, they spoil and he loses money. But if you go in there and he doesn't order enough, there's an empty shelf and he loses a sale and he loses money. And then you go back up in your helicopter and say, I'm going to see what's making this happen. There must be some magic person in the government telling them how many eggs to get every day. And you watch, and you watch, and you watch, and there's nobody directing it. It just goes, and you say, it must be a miracle. No, it's local, on the, on the ground, feet on the ground, knowledge by which the local manager knows through experience and previous managers before him keeping records, they know on October 14th they're going to need these many eggs, and October 15th these many, whereas the holiday this many. And no government in the world can make those decisions accurately. I've been in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. I've seen the rotting, the, the rotting goods in the grocery stores. I've seen the sour milk and the empty shelves. Can't do it. I've been in department stores in Leningrad, and I've seen rows and rows of coats that nobody wants to buy because they're the wrong size and the wrong color. So what is a free market? It's a wonderful, here's a definition, it's a wonderful God-given process in human societies through which the goods and services that are produced by the society, the supply, continually adjust to exactly match the goods and services that are wanted by the society, that's demand, at each period of time, and through which the society assigns a measurable value to each good and service at each period of time entirely through the free choices of every individual person in the society, rather than through government control. But this process needs some government regulation to prevent wrongdoing such as theft, fraud, and breaking of contracts. Finally, and this is the end, the third thing that will contribute to greater productivity and greater fulfillment of work in a society is viewing business as morally good. Now I come around full circle. It is morally good in God's sight, as I explained from the beginning, to produce products from the earth for the benefit of other people. We should honor and encourage that process. We should have a society that values that process and does not demean it as materialism or greed or exploitation, exploitation of the earth. And we as Christians above all people should not be demeaning that wonderful God-given process as exploitation of the earth or materialism or greed. We should insist that God views ordinary business activity, including profits, not as morally evil, but as, and not as morally good, neutral, but as morally good. I realize that business activities can be done in immoral ways and for immoral purposes, but that is not true of most business activities, and actually most people in the business world who act in immoral ways eventually fail. In general, business activities are morally good and should receive our and the church's and society's approval and praise. However, societies can view business as evil. When society loses the Christian view of the moral goodness of business, then business can easily be viewed as evil. Rightful business activities in developing and subduing the earth can be opposed as exploiting the earth by environmentalists for whom Mother Earth is a new God, a God that must be left untouched or unused. Or e employers can be thought of as evil bourgeois capitalists who exploit the laborers and wrongfully derive profit from their labor. If people think business is evil, they will hesitate to start businesses. They'll never feel real freedom to enjoy working in business or think of it as a calling from God. 
because it'll always be tainted with the faint cloud of guilt. Who can enjoy being an evil materialist who works with evil money to earn evil profits by exploiting laborers and producing material goods that feed people's evil greed and enhance, enhance their evil pride and sustain their evil inequality of possessions and feed their evil, evil competitiveness. Who wants to devote his life to such an evil pursuit as business? What government would want to have laws and policies that encourage such an evil thing as business? If business is evil, then why not tax it and regulate it until it can barely survive? And so poverty remains because business activity will be hindered at every point. But if Christians change their attitudes toward business and their attitude then of the world toward business, then who could resist being a God-pleasing subduer of the earth who uses the amazing materials from God's good creation and works with the God-given gift of money to earn morally good profits and shows love to his neighbors by giving them jobs and producing goods that overcome world poverty and enable people to glorify God for his goodness, thanking God for goods that sustain just and fair differences in possessions and encourage morally good and beneficial competition, what a great career that would be. What a great activity for governments to favor and encourage. What a solution to world poverty. What a great way to give glory to God. Thanks. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.